Hi there, my name is Sarah Peternell. I am the owner of Family Nutrition Services in Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much for watching today's YouTube video. In a few minutes, I'm going to be interviewing a wonderful doctor, Dr. Brianna Seafelt. Uh, Dr. Seafelt is a doctor of osteopathic medicine here in Denver, Colorado, and she is the owner of Direct Osteopathic Primary Care. To learn more about Dr. Bree and her medical practice, you can visit the pinned comments at the bottom of today's video. I'm excited to be interviewing Dr. Bree because not only is she my doctor and also a very trusted colleague, um, and our children go to the same elementary school here in Denver, but I have also been incredibly impressed with the way that Dr. Bree has been communicating with her patients and with the larger uh, Denver community where we live about the coronavirus outbreak and the ways in which we need to be addressing this um, personally in terms of our responsibilities for preventing the illness and also medically the ways in which we can take best care of ourselves uh, during this time of both social distancing and also ways in which to just take really good care of our health. So Dr. Bree will be joining me uh, to in today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bree. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining me for this interview today. <laughs> and I am very excited to hear um, some of your thoughts regarding the COVID-19 slash coronavirus outbreak that we're currently dealing with. You've been sharing a lot of wonderful information with your patients and our community at large. And I was hoping you could share some of your thoughts today to the folks who will be watching this YouTube video. My first question for you is, what do you think are the best sort of natural ways that we can take care of ourselves to prevent contraction of COVID-19? That is such a good question, Sarah. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of patients that are interested in holistic and alternative medicine. And so um, prevention has always been on the top of everyone's list and whether you're preventing heart disease or preventing, you know, other health issues. So, you know, prevention with COVID-19, I think is absolutely the way to think about it. Um, as an osteopath, I was taught that um, the body um, uh, is always working towards balance and homeostasis. And osteopaths truly and fundamentally believe in our health. And so the way that I kind of think of this as, you know, how do we build up our health during this time? I mean, now is the time where you want your health to be at its tip top shape. And so anything that you would normally do or normally know that you quote unquote should do, right? All, all the things on your should list, um, you know, should be things that you're taking the time to do right now. Um, I had a patient that messaged in yesterday that said, I know that I know what I should be doing and I'm not doing it. So I said to her today, Hey, let's go on a walk. Let's take a, like, have a visit and go on a walk. So said, bundle up. It's cold out there. So in 24 degrees, we're both walking and talking and just getting ourselves out there. So, you know, fresh air every day, um, gentle exercise, making sure you sleep enough. Um, it's a, you know, a great time to binge on videos and things like that if you want to, if that's relaxing to you, but not until one o'clock in the morning, that's not a good time. <laughs> right. No. So, I mean, just the things that you know you need to do, you know, like you, as you know, as a nutritionist, eating good food, eating healthy food and whole foods and, you know, thank goodness oranges are in season and blueberries are in season. There's some really great high antioxidants, high vitamin C foods, even, you know, bell peppers have a really high amount of vitamin C. So, so, you know, you know, Googling, you know, or, or asking your local nutrition expert, like what, you know, foods are high in vitamin C and, and how do I get zinc? I think, what is it? Zinc is in some sort of nut, I feel like. I know selenium is in nuts. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can get this nutrition through your foods right now. And that is something that you have control over. Um, and then, you know, I think the biggest thing is stress reduction. Um, you know, outside of COVID complaints and worries and coughs and colds, that have been coming up for patients in the last couple of weeks, which we fielded a lot of telemedicine visits on, um, I would say the next most common is anxiety, depression, and insomnia. You know, and that's kind of a three-headed beast of, you know, anxiety, um, depression, and insomnia. And I think... Um, 
people are having a hard time because there's no end in sight. Like there's not a clear day by this day, everything's going to go back to normal. We don't, we're still all adjusting to this new normal. We don't really know what it's going to look like. And we know from, you know, stress studies of the longest times that rats in cages that get randomly electrically shocked are the most stressed rats, right? Whereas the rats that control their own shock, they do so much better, right? So if you have that sense of agency and you have that sense of control, Control over your environment, your stress is going to be less. And we don't have that right now. There's, we don't have it. So um, whatever you would normally do then to control your stress, whether that's sleeping, journaling, talking to friends, um, exercising, um, you know, taking supplements um, that can be helpful for stress reduction. Uh, now is really the time to do that. Um, even a gratitude practice. I mean, something so simple as gratitude has actually been scientifically proven to improve your immune system. So, you know, saying three things to your partner that you appreciate that day or three things at dinner with your kids or writing them down at bed in your own journal. Um, there's a pretty good science behind that gratitude practice um, of writing down three things that you're grateful for every evening for like 10 days or 12 days or something like that. And then it has some long-term benefit on your mood. Um, so, you know, those are all the kind of basic things. Um, the thing that came up for me today when I was reflecting on um, COVID, what I noticed today is that a couple of my visits were entirely social today. People just needed to connect. And this time of social distancing, I wish, I wish it could have been called physical distancing. It needs to be physically distant. Like you and I are not hanging out right now, but we're hanging out, you know? So it's great. We're being social and we should be social because we're social creatures. And, you know, my five-year-old was having a hard time with it today. My 72-year-old patient was having a hard time and just wanted to connect. You know, there's a whole range of us that are, are suffering from this in many different ways, um, some of which we don't even know. You know, there's a great article circulating around out there about how there's a lot of grief right now, a lot of collective grief. And so, you know, part of that is naming it, part of that is recognizing it, and part of that is just realizing we need each other. So that could be a phone call, you know, a, a video visit, a phone visit, a Zoom happy hour with your friends. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, but we are social creatures and we need to recognize that and reach out to each other. I think those are all like super important. And then of course there's vitamin C and getting enough of that vitamin D as in dog. Um, you know, zinc is helpful. Um, I think those are the top three supplements. There's some information floating around on melatonin. I, you know, I don't know the data on that well enough to know if that's super helpful. Um, there was some worry about elderberry and cytokine storm. So I'll just pause on that one for a brief minute. Um, uh, so cytokine storm is when the inflammatory process of your body's immune system gets raging and gets out of control and unchecked. And that's what leads to the respiratory distress and respiratory failure in COVID-19 patients with coronavirus. So clearly cytokine storm is bad. That is very clear. Um, I do not believe that elderberry um, induces cytokine storm. There has been some information about that on the internet, and some people were concerned about that because there were some remote studies in vitro that elderberry might increase a couple of those interleukins or those cytokines. Um, but there's no evidence that um, elderberry is dangerous for people or would induce the kind of trigger. I mean, you know, when I talk about supplements, I always say that they're like a kind of a weaker hammer for that nail, right? So if you have depression and you want to try supplements, it's it's okay if you have mild depression and you can exercise and go to therapy and do other things. It's a weaker hammer for that nail, but it will work um, in some cases. Um, some people need the big guts. Some people that's not going to be enough, you know, and I would say it's the same with elderberry. It's going to be a weaker hammer on that inflammatory cascade. And I think it has a lot of health benefits um, with very, very little risk. So I think elderberry is safe and fine to use. And I've seen several, you know, professionals in my circles of alternative medicine, people saying that's fine to use. Um, I think there's healthy mushrooms. I think there's, you know, there's other healthy options um, in terms of supplements, but there's not one like go-to right now. Um, the other one I'm using a lot in my pulmonary patients with pulmonary disease and um, asthma is um, N-acetylcysteine. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we, we know that N-acetylcysteine is helpful with influenza. We know that N-acetylcysteine, um, you know, had a study a couple, gosh, it was probably like five or more years ago about people with chronic lung disease, asthma, COPD, emphysema, um, that they had fewer um, exacerbations or worsening of their chronic bronchitis um, if they were taking N-acetylcysteine. So I have been having my patients do N-acetylcysteine 600 milligrams twice a day. It's an amino acid. Um, it's not, you know, I think the harm in it is very low. Um, um, it's it's an antioxidant. It helps you with Tylenol overdose. That's how we use it in the hospital as a as a prescription pharmaceutical. So um, I don't I don't feel like there's much harm in using that one, and there might be significant benefit. Absolutely, I'm really glad you brought all of those up, including uh, I know I've had the question from a lot of my clients about maybe herbal preparations and adaptogens that they've been using to support their immune system because mm -hmm. of the autoimmune or chronic. Yep. chronic and inflammatory con uh, conditions or symptoms and concern that some of those preparations might be overstimulating and they're getting, you know, the word sort of about what is this cytokine storm that we need to be concerned about. I think you addressing it that way is very helpful. And also I couldn't agree more on n acetylcysteine and I've been saying that during cold and flu season forever anyway. <laughs> Me too, oh, yeah. But it's a great amino acid. It's a great um, antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And the research really is... Um, is there on the pulmonary benefits and just creating nice juicy tissues in the body. Right. Right. So thank you for bringing both of those up. I really appreciate that. Um, now, Dr. Bree, if I know you're doing a lot of telemedicine with your patients yep. and what type of advice would you give to people if they suspect whether they know if they've been exposed or not, that they suspect they're actually coming down with coronavirus like symptoms. What, what is the first line therapy? What do you suggest yep. people do? Um, well, the first line therapy is not to freak out because <laughs> I mean, it's so easy, you know, I mean, it is so easy to freak out and, um, that's not helpful. Uh, that increases your cortisol. Cortisol is not helpful for your immune system. So just, um, so the first thing is take a deep breath, um, recognize that, um, you know, in the beginning of this, um, you know, outbreak, um, there were certain things like coronavirus doesn't present as a runny nose and mm -hmm. coronavirus doesn't present as ear pain and coronavirus is, you know, doesn't present as a sore throat. Um, I think as we get into this, um, you know, process, uh, even this, even this conversation will be obsolete in two weeks as far as we know, you know, because it changes all the time. And so this week, um, I've been seeing that, um, I think coronavirus masquerades a lot. And so I can no longer say um, that that runny nose is not coronavirus. I, can, I can't say that. Now, of course, we're coming into allergy season. So if your eyes are itching and your nose is itching and your nose is running and your throat's kind of sore from post-nasal drip, it probably is allergies. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so, but I can't say that an upper respiratory um, viral infection right now isn't coronavirus and a lower respiratory is because that's where we thought this line was in the beginning. And it turns out 25% of people aren't going to have any symptoms at all. Yeah. And that ranges from 15 to 40% in studies of people that are what we call asymptomatic carriers. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really tough number to swallow. And that's a very hard thing for the medical community. It's hard for our population because that means a quarter of the people that are in, in, transmitting this infectious particle have no idea. They they're don't even have a runny nose that they don't think is coronavirus. They don't even have a runny nose. I mean, they don't have anything. No symptoms, asymptomatic. Um, the, you know, I talked to uh, somebody last week who was in New York um, who had been tested, was positive. Um, and that person's only symptom was a little stuffy nose and loss of t um, taste and smell. Um, wow. So the loss of taste and smell has been a thing in the media, and that actually has been showing up in the ENT literature. So I think an early sign of loss of taste and smell is a concern for coronavirus. Um, and, um, you know, of course, if you have a sinus infection, you're not going to taste and smell very well either. So it couldn't doesn't have to be coronavirus. But the, the moral of the story is right now, there's a lot of symptoms that, uh, that can fall into that bucket. So, you know, identifying it, recognizing it, you saying, I don't know, could this be coronavirus? It could. So the first thing to do is not freak out. And the second thing to do is to lay low, 
to <laughs> decide that whatever kind of home restriction you were on before, you're on more of one now. Mm -hmm. So um, in your household, if you're with other people, that means going to your own bedroom, um, you know, changing the sheets of where you recently were, changing the towels, the hand towels, the kitchen towels, mm -hmm. cleaning um, shared spaces. If you have the luxury of having your own bathroom um, or your own sleeping place that is um, that can be, you know, not a communal space, um, that's what you should do. That's the first thing you should do is recognize you want to keep it to yourself. Um, even if you have the sniffles right now, I keep telling people, even if you don't have coronavirus, you don't want to pass around another virus right now because anybody with a virus right now, cough, cold, sore throat, ear pain, whatever, they're going to freak out a little bit and then they might freak somebody else out. Somebody else who gets it might freak out. And so we kind of contribute to our like panic in our community. Number one, number two, that person might run out to get tested. Now we'll talk about testing, but if that person runs out to get testing, heaven forbid they try to go to the emergency room to do that, you can catch coronavirus there. <laughs> so don't do that. You might have to hospital for sure if you can, right? Right, right. Absolutely. So, you know, the first thing is, is don't freak out self-quarantine even more. It's kind of like when you baby proof and you first have a baby, you know, by the time they're six months, you have to baby proof all over again because like nothing is baby proofed anymore. So you're on home quarantine and you think you're doing a good job and then you think you have coronavirus and now you're really going to do a good job. You know, now you're going to dot your I's and cross your teams on your home quarantine, not go to the grocery store, get things delivered, reach out to your community, tell someone, tell someone you think you're sick. Tell them when you're not sure if you have coronavirus so that they know how you're feeling. Ideally, that person is your healthcare provider also. So a loved one, a family member, a friend, um, and you know somebody that you can talk to medically. Um, we are doing telemedicine visits for new patients. We're trying to keep people out of the ER and out of urgent cares because that's not the place to be. Um, and um, you know, if your doctor's doing that, then great. If they're not, there's other telemedicine um, services that are not ours only, you know, on the state health department, Colorado State Public Health Department, they have a list of telemedicine and uh, telenurses lines. Um, the CDC has some lines. There's lots of people. There's even a symptom tracker on the CDC that's very good actually as well, kind of give you a predictability of whether they think you have coronavirus based on your constellation of symptoms. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is it is a constellation. Like it is a whole picture. Like if you wake up one day you have a little scratchy throat and then the next day you have a headache and then the next day you're a little nauseated um but they don't all happen at the same time and it's not progressive or worsening and there's no fever and no cough it's okay those are okay symptoms to let go of. You don't have to worry that that is, you know, some scary coronavirus um, masquerading. Um, when we have a viral infection, our body re responds in concert, right? So it's not these individual notes. Oh, I, it's easy when you look at a website to say, oh, I had that two weeks ago and I had this yesterday and oh my gosh, this morning I woke up with this one, right? It's not like that. The body, when it's fighting off something, it like is a concert. It's not any individual note or any individual instrument. It's it's the body kind of, you know, playing this concert of response. And so, you know, that looks like a music, you know, a musical piece in the way that it's coordinated. It keeps happening. It gets worse and worse over time. And it gets your attention. You know, your, your immune system, when you have coronavirus, it gets your attention. I mean, you feel really crappy. People feel exhausted. Um, and they um, generally have a fever and generally have a cough and shortness of breath. Those are the primary symptoms. We see any digestive symptoms symptoms as part yeah. of the picture. I've been getting that question as well. Yeah, digestive symptoms have preceded a lot of cases, nausea and vomiting, sometimes diarrhea, um, and um, and that can precede further symptoms of COVID by like 36, 48 hours, or sometimes be within the first week of symptoms. But again, that's that concert of my body's under attack, right? Like my body is fighting off a virus, it's doing all these things, so it's it's trying to get rid of it. It you know all of our symptoms are either the direct effect of the infection, but more often an effect of our immune system against the infection. So it's your immune system fighting that off that we start to see those, um, those symptoms happen. So, you know, the first thing again is don't freak out. Second thing is keep yourself quarantined. Third thing is call your provider. Um, I want to speak about testing. Yeah, please do. I know people are really curious. Oh, I am upset about testing. We could have a whole interview about testing. <laughs> yeah. 
upsets me um, to no end. I made a five part video on why family doctors should not be doing testing, but I didn't publish it anywhere because it was more just cathartic for me to make it. My kids were acting in it. It was very cute. Maybe one day somebody will, will whip it all together. I don't have the technical prowess to whip together five iPhone videos and into one beautiful, nice movie. Um, but the reason I don't think that individual practices should be doing testing, number one, I don't think we can protect our staff and our employees adequately. Um, number two, we can't get supplies. So in the beginning, um, LabCorp and Quest, we're sending about 10 supplies per doctor's office per week, really? 10 total. Then they started sending four and five. Often in many areas, they're running out of the swabs. They're running out of the reagents. The LabCorp turnaround time, I'm sorry, LabCorp, for giving you bad press, but has been up to 12 days. Yeah. So if you look at quarantine time, um, which is, okay, I think I have coronavirus and I, now I'm being really restrictive and I'm doing my good job staying at home and being self-quarantined within my house against other people. How long do I need to do that for? And that question is um, out there. There's some interesting evidence on it and there's a lot of you know different opinion on it. But I would say that that is anywhere from seven to 10 days from the onset of your symptoms plus three fever-free days. So if you don't get a fever until day seven, you get three more days of quarantine, okay? If you have a fever in the beginning and it goes away, then you're in that seven to 10 days from the onset. So my rule of thumb is 10 days from the onset of your, fe of your symptoms um, and three fever-free days. Wow. So you want both of those things, right? So if we look at that, let's say the whole thing took 14 days, right? That's how long it takes to get a test back? <laughs> So what's the point of putting yourself at risk or putting other healthcare providers at risk or putting the system at risk mm -hmm. uh, in order to get testing? Now, I understand testing from a mental health perspective. It's so good to just know, you know what to expect. You can worry or not worry that much. Um, you can monitor yourself really closely. I understand testing from a public health perspective and an epidemiologic perspective, but that testing should be coordinated, mm -hmm. efficient feasible and have a quick turnaround time that is set in certain centers or parts of the city that can handle the volume that is needed and we can divert the proper protective equipment to the healthcare professionals in those places and that's not what we're doing. Right and without those procedures in place especially at the risk of so many other people in the effort to get testing yeah. your advice really would be you know unless you are having what severe breathing problems where you yeah. are requiring emergent care yeah. you know very serious cases otherwise stay home follow your, your guidance follow your sort of you know one two three four things to do yep. don't go out seeking testing when when you'd be better off at home that's my advice right now, unless testing changes. So I just ordered IgG and IgM tests, which we can talk about what those mean in terms of immunity. Um, but um, I just ordered... Now, if you, if you want to just jump yeah. in. Yeah, so... I mean, testing and antibodies and what that means. This is a yeah. huge thing that a lot of people want to know. Yeah. Am I protected if I get it? Right. And I would love to say yes. <laughs> In fact, I think I said that at our last open house there. I was like, the good news is if you get it, then you can help other people and you can be a part of the workforce or you could, you know, like, are we going to have like, a workforce who's immune and a workforce who's who's at home who's not immune after this? Like, I don't know. Um, I listened to Trevor Noah and uh, uh, Dr. Fossey, um, the, you know, amazing in, uh, infectious disease specialist who's kind of in charge of this at the top of the country, who's a really smart guy. Um, and he had this question uh, uh, with Trevor. And, you know, I think what he said, which I loved, which is if this virus behaves like any other virus that we've ever seen before, we can assume that there will be some immunity to it after contracting it. Um, the tests that we have, so we have IgG and IgM tests. IgM is your first antibody. It's your first kind of fighter. So this new testing line coming out, which are blood tests, not nasal, um, fair, you know, nasal secretions or oral secretions or spit tests. They're actually blood tests. And they look for the antibody. The acute antibody shows up after four days of symptoms. So you don't make that antibody until you've had been sick for four days. So you couldn't do that test before the four days, generally speaking. Um, and after after some time, you make this, you know, antibody that remembers the infection that stays around supposedly forever. So that's your IgG antibody. Um, so we didn't even have tests on IgM and IgG on coronavirus until this month. 
So it's such a new disease. They literally didn't even exist. So now we have those tests, which is great. They're coming out. I just ordered, like I said, um, you know, a handful of them, a couple handfuls of them for our clinic because I know at some point we'll need them. Um, there are a lot of very different tests like that on the market. So I think you have to be really conscious as a healthcare provider um, and as a consumer where you get those tests because my husband is a chemical engineer. He's a biotech guy. So he's really smart and he's like way smarter than me and does all sorts of fancy things like tries to cure cancer in his daytime job. So, you know, I have him read all the very detailed nitty gritty information that these companies are putting out. And I'm like, what about this one? What about that one? And, you know, one of the things that happens is there are many, many, many coronaviruses. It is the common cold. There are many of these types of viruses. We are looking for one very specific coronavirus. So when you try to match that antibody response to that coronavirus, it has to be to the you know SARS-CoV-3 <laughs> virus. So you have to use proteins from that virus. You have to use very like you know pieces. Like you have to cut the head off of that virus and put it in the well and make sure that that's what your test is actually reacting to. It can't be another coronavirus. It can't be an immune response to coronaviruses in general. Um, and so that's the word on the testing is you really have to look into the data, you know, as a physician purchasing these for your, your clinic. Um, there's some that are coming out at $9.95 each and a box of 100 I don't trust those ones at all. I have had several providers that are wanting to buy them and I just don't think it's smart. I you know, looked at the data in depth with my husband and we don't, I, I can't stand by those tests. Um, I don't think they're accurate from a, a what we call sensitivity and specificity perspective. Um, and you have to remember that none of these are FDA approved because the FDA doesn't have any time right now to have them go through their normal process. So all of these are authorized, if at all, under the Emergency Use Act. So they're out there because companies can put push them through quickly right now, but not because they've been tested thoroughly, not because they can be trusted. So I think you really have to do your homework on it. The company that we ordered from, um, it comes out of Germany. It's a company called Farm Act, P-H-A-R-M-A-C-T. And they're being sold by a company that's imported them to California, Southern California called Vivera Pharmaceuticals. Um, it's a more expensive test, but I think um, they know what they're doing. They're using the SARS-CoV-2 um, so I think that that is going to be a better antibody test. But the question is, when you have IgG antibody, does that mean you're immune? And we don't know for sure because it hasn't been around long enough. Mm -hmm. For example, you know that you can get the common cold every year, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and you can get influenza every year, right? Exactly. Because those viruses mutate just a little bit, you know? But we do know that if you get influenza, that you have a better immune response to it the next time you get it. Even if you get it again, you don't get usually as sick. And one of the reasons we vaccinate is because people that are vaccinated year after year after year to influenza build a better antibody response over time. So it's almost like mapping the virus. It may grow another head or, or shoot off another leg or something, but it's like the body slowly but surely can start to be like, ah, I know this thing, you know? Um, so we're hoping that there is some converted immunity, but there's not any data on that yet, unfortunately. But at least now we have a test so that we could start to see if somebody had an IgG antibody response. Um, is that a person that can get, gets it again? So my question about the difference between um, the like nasopharyngeal or swab test yeah. versus the uh, serum tests. Yes. One of the concerns is obviously exposing um, you know, family practices and, and small staff without proper, you know, PPE and, you know, right. Like we just said, like, don't go in and seek yeah. testing because yeah. that may be one of the worst ways to actually, you know, carry the virus and infect others is antibody or IgG testing something that a person would seek after the fact then is this like, it's not yeah. diagnostic for the acute phase, but it's like, Hey, yeah. A while has passed. Now I'm just curious. Yes. Is that what it's totally? Doing? And that's one of the reasons why I ordered the tests because, according to the company Vivera Pharmaceuticals, this test is good up to 22 to 24 days past in, um, infection. So yeah, you could easily have somebody wait out their 10 to 14 day quarantine period and then come in and say, "Gosh, was that was that coronavirus? Are you immune?" Once we know what that IgG antibody response is, the other reason I like these tests is they're not actually serum; they're blood spot. 
So you're actually like a finger poke and like two drops of blood. And they come back within minutes, anywhere from two minutes to 20 minutes, depending on the company, they're literally rapid, you know, bedside tests. And so none of these are authorized for patients to do on their own, but I certainly do not have to authorize. I don't have to personally poke people's fingers to check their blood sugar. Okay. Right. At home. Right. Let people do the blood spot test on their own and nail it into the lab. Is that how that works? That's not necessarily, um, promoted by the companies. So I'll have to see what the test kits look like and how complicated they are when I get them. Sometimes I'm kind of rogue and willing to think outside the box that way. But my point is they're very easy to facilitate. Now, a nasopharyngeal swab is not comfortable. It actually has to go from your nose back like halfway to your ear. They say, go back into the nose till you feel like you're touching the brain. I mean, it literally is, it's gross. And you can imagine having a cough and, and having, you know, and having somebody do that, you're going to cough in their face. I mean, you know, that's the issue. And the other one is the gag one that the, everybody hates with the strep testing. That's the oral pharyngeal, you know, your, your doctor and they push the tongue down and they gag you. And you know, that one is easy to cough too. So, you know, the, and the tests that we're using right now, nasopharyngeal and oral pharyngeal, in my opinion, are not the safest ways to get those tests done. Right. So I think that when we can do blood spot testing, um, it will be a lot safer for providers and patients, um, and it will provide different data um, that hopefully is better data. I don't know. It's different data and a definitely a better turnaround time. So that's a light on the horizon. And again, there's going to be lots of people that are going to have different modalities for those tests. We just you know hope that they're all up to snuff. Um, the testing right now, as it stands today, um, is that if you, you know, have the coronavirus, um, getting back to what to expect if you have it, the weird thing about true coronavirus, COVID-19, um, is that it tends to get worse between days five and 12. So, it, you know, most people, when they're sick, they're on my radar for a couple of days. And then, you know, if I don't hear from them, I'm assuming they're better. So this is different. Our coronavirus patients, we are checking in with them every 48 to 72 hours through the course of their illness until they're completely through it. Because what we have noticed in the healthcare industry is that the patients with true coronavirus, they're fine and fine and fine until they're not. And when they're not, they go down in a matter of hours. And we're talking respiratory distress, needing oxygen, needing a face mask, to, we called a non-rebreather, needing intubation within a 24-hour period of time in some cases. It's a very, very scary thing. That's one of the reasons why healthcare providers are freaking out. Because it's you know, we don't, we don't like things that we're not can control over, number one. Number two, we don't like things we can't predict, you know? And so if you see someone in their day eight of their illness and they seem like they're better, they're doing fine, and then all of a sudden they're struggling to breathe, they can't catch a breath. Now, this is an interesting complaint, the struggling to breathe. I've heard a lot of that this week, like my test feels tight and I'm struggling to breathe. A struggling to breathe that's a pulmonary thing is like, you know, I feel like I'm running, like I, you know, went for a run and I'm, man, I'm like, whoo, I feel short of breath and I'm not running and I'm not exerting myself. I'm just sitting here feeling like that. That is not okay. But anxiety, it feels like there's an elephant sitting on my chest and I can't breathe and it feels kind of tight. And ugh, Do I have coronavirus? That's a different kind of breathing problem. My kids did a great acting piece on our, on our articles page over and our YouTube channel over what, you know, that looks like trying to describe it a little bit more, but a true, you know, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, coughing so much that you can't like speak in full sentences. We call it um, two sentence dyspnea. You can't, you know, say two sentences without, and then I'm gonna, and then, yeah, I think I'm doing okay. I'm just uh, whew, coming in from taking the grocery store. You know, you're talking to your, your loved one who has had coronavirus for a week and a half, and that's how they sound over the phone. You're going to say, I don't think that sounds okay. Have you called someone? You might need to get checked. You might need to have your oxygen level checked because those patients have to go in right away. You can't do that for another day and just see how it is tomorrow. When you start to feel short of breath like that, you've got to go into the emergency room. And in the emergency room, they will determine if you need oxygen. And if they determine you need oxygen, they will determine if you need to stay overnight and they will determine if you need a test. And that's where the testing is happening in Colorado right now. Good to know. So the final question that I have, and I think probably one of the most important questions that especially people that I work with who especially 
look to nutrition and supplements and lifestyle support because of either autoimmune or chronic conditions or chronic digestive conditions, they're wondering, are they the types of people that would be considered compromised or have underlying conditions, you know, to be at a higher risk? And if so, what is the concern? Why are um, people with these underlying pre-existing conditions having more trouble with coronavirus? Yeah, I think that's um, a really good question because I think when we lump autoimmune disease and chronic disease as two separate categories, um, there's a lot of things that like lay people and non-doctor people think of in those categories. And then there's things that, you know, the physician type mind thinks of in those categories and they're slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at coronavirus, there's no evidence that people with Hashimoto's or MS are at increased risk for the infection. Um, actually pose this question on a doctor's page. And I would think that MS patients might actually be at increased risk. Um, and there was a neurologist and an endocrinologist on there that thought that they don't know any reason why that disease mechanism would put people at increased increased risk. The place where the increased risk comes for somebody like somebody with MS or somebody like my husband who has inflammatory bowel disease, um, if those patients are on immunosuppressive drugs, then they are at risk because their immune system doesn't act normally, it doesn't respond normally, and it is suppressed. So if you're on a medication that suppresses or changes your immune system, a medication, not a supplement that changes your immune response or not a supplement that supports your immunity or, or any of those things, if you're on a medication that changes your immunity, then yes, you have increased risk. Um, but if you have Hashimoto's, if you have irritable bowel, but not inflammatory, bowel, um, if you have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, if you have um, uh, you know, autoimmune conditions like celiac disease, um, you're most likely not going to be at increased risk for COVID. There's no evidence at this time that you would be at increased risk because none of those um, immune system problems affect the, um, uh, those are, we call those autoimmune, right? Your body's immune system has gone after normal tissue and done something wrong, but it's not the immune system system that's your fighter immune system that's dysregulated. Gotcha. So it's kind of a different branch of the same army. That's very helpful. So um, I know that some people who are watching this video, especially, you know, a lot of times um, autoimmune diseases go hand in hand. Somebody may have celiac yeah. or something else. They may have yeah. or something else. If they are taking an immune suppressive drug, yeah. maybe like methotrexate, mm -hmm something like you know, a stronger yeah. medication yeah. that they're taking to control one of their autoimmune conditions. Yes. Um, those are the individuals that need to be most concerned yes. about symptoms arising and then why, what happens? Yeah. Um, well, and, you know, this is an interesting question because, um, you know, my husband's on a medication to suppress his immune system. And so when we're thinking about and pontificating scientifically, like we like to do in our household about, um, you know, uh, COVID, we're like, well, does that mean that you're actually going to be better off because when you get to you know cytokine storm and ARDS, maybe your lungs will be fine because your immune system won't freak out because um, it is an immune system problem. Like your immune system again goes on hyperdrive. It's not the actual virus that creates the problem in the later stages of coronavirus. Um, it's actually your body's immune reaction to that that creates the illness um, severity. So um, he dove into that literature, and unfortunately, there's no evidence that that Humira is helpful um, in the later stages of coronavirus. But um, there are medications that are being used right now, anti-interleukin-6, Tamactra, I think. Um, it's got an MAB, toco tocolizumab or something like that. I'm not even sure how to, I think it's uh, called Tamactra, uh, its other name. Every medicine has to have two names just to be exciting. Um, but that medicine is an anti-interleukin-6, and that one is being used right now in the later stages. Um, because again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to quell the immune system, saying immune system, calm down. Same thing with Plaquenil um, or um, hydroxychloroquine. Chloroquine has gotten a lot of media in the last couple of weeks. Um, I was just on a conversation with um, UC Health um, and uh, Denver Health uh, infectious disease specialists and people with the Colorado Health Department earlier this week, and that has not been FDA approved. <laughs> there was some mixed um, information in the media. Um, those treatments have not been FDA approved, but one of the ways that they probably do work um, is by modifying the immune response. So somebody with lupus, for example, 
they have, you know, an autoimmune problem, their immune systems got a little haywire and they have caught, you know, caused the disease complex we call systemic uh, lupus. And that person may be on Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine to control that immune response. And that person, is that person then actually protected from coronavirus? We don't know for sure. Um, but they do really, 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 really recommend right now not using those medicines. If you happen to have them at home from traveling or, you know, have an anti-malarial at home, don't just take it because they cause um, a prolongation of the um, QTC in your heart. And so they actually change the electrical activity in your heart a little bit and they can cause your heart to stop. Like it can, it's, yeah. Um, especially in combination with a Z-Pak or azithromycin. So that combination was studied that it might actually be helpful for coronavirus, but if you're going to use that combination, that should be in a hospital where an EKG can be done, um, where people can know that your heart is safe enough for those medications in combination or separately. So right now, you're actually not able to prescribe those medicines in Colorado as an outpatient um, because the pharmacy um, board has put um, an end to that um, because they don't feel that it's safe, they don't feel it has great evidence, and they need those uh, medications for their inpatient hospitalized um, COVID. People who would be taking those medications if they do have lupus can still access. Exactly. Home. Those are the only people that can fill those at the pharmacy right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why those people are increased risk, um, you know, to COVID, I don't know that we know completely that mechanism. Um, if we look at the chronic disease bucket, um, that's where we look at heart disease um, and people with diabetes. Um, and we know that those folks are at increased risk, people um, that are older and people that have chronic lung disease. Um, those are all increased risk categories. And we know that because the immune system is dysregulated in those, um, in those folks, so older folks don't have as good of immunity um, and diabetics um, because their body is dealing with hyperglycemia all the time and trying to fight that off. Their immune system is dysregulated. Um, they get, you know, foot infections and, and other infections more often. So this wouldn't be a surprise. They would be more prone to get coronavirus infections. Um, and our cardiac patients are at increased risk. Congenital heart disease and other true heart disease like heart failure um, are at increased risk because in the later stages of coronavirus, kind of the worst um, stages um, after the acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome or ARDS, which I've referenced a few times this talk. Mm -hmm. um, another concern in the later stages is actually heart failure, acute mm -hmm. heart failure. So there's a, um, a thing called you know congestive heart failure, but you get that usually after decades. Um, there are some people that can get a viral cardiomyopathy where the heart muscle just gets floppy and flabby and starts dysfunctioning uh, acutely from after a viral infection. And that has been the cause of death in many people with later stages of coronavirus. So that's one of the reasons why we know our cardiac patients are at increased risk. Yeah. So um, in, in the time we have left, my last question, and it's yeah. kind of along those lines would be, have you been seeing that this virus does not necessarily discriminate against those with underlying conditions versus those that are healthy? That's, I think that's been a big kind of miss, yeah. maybe nomer that only the elderly or only those with um, pre-existing conditions like the ones you just described are really the ones that are the most vulnerable. Is that true still? I don't think that that's true. I think in Colorado, especially, we're seeing that everybody is vulnerable. Um, the good news is, is that 80% of people will still have a mild course. Um, and so, you know, that is true that 80% of people will still have a mild course and probably many more people have it or had it or carried it asymptomatically and didn't even know um, than we realized. So the numbers probably look better to some degree than we even know because we're not testing everyone. Um, but I would say that it's agnostic anybody can catch it, anybody can get it. Um, whether you're going to be that 20% that has a bad course, hopefully not. Um, but you're at increased risk for that bad course if you have those risk factors. Mm -hmm. So that's why not spreading it around and not feeling cavalier and not feeling like this shouldn't apply to you or you're not in a demographic where you're at risk really shouldn't be out there. I mean, we'll see case reports of young people dying. We'll see case reports of children, unfortunately. Um, you know, there are, those will happen in this epidemic. 
Um, but in Colorado, especially, we're seeing a lot of people in their 40s and 50s in the hospital, in the ICU that are sick. Um, we have a very healthy population of 40, 50 year olds that were skiing and enjoying themselves and doing what they should do for their health over, um, you know, the, the spring break that came and visited Colorado and, um, and people that were just up there um, enjoying as we do with the mountains in Colorado. And that I think is one of the reasons we're seeing um, a lot of that demographic, but it is not, um, unfortunately, you're not immune, literally, literally, well, you don't know if you're literally immune, but we're not even sure if you're figuratively uh, immune to this at this point. And that's why the best thing we can do is just make ourselves comfortable at home, kind of dig in, um, recognize all those things that you can do at home, get creative, you know, like we're getting, we're seeing a lot of creativity with people as soon as you're bored or depressed or like my one patient said, melancholy, which I think is such a good description for it, you know, then, then kick your own butt and get out there, get some fresh air, like walk around a little bit, even if it's brisk, like today, you know, get on the floor and play with your kids, um, take a mental until break, have a date night. We, my husband and I had a date night at our house the other day. The kids wanted to have me in bed to say goodnight. I said, honey, I'm watching a movie with dad. I'm sorry, we're having a date night. So we had a little date night. Yeah. And the next night I had a Zoom, you know, uh, happy hour with some girlfriends just to have some girl time. I mean, you know, take a shower. It's like a glorious thing that you can do right now that can kind of change your energy for the day. Yeah. You know, do all the things that you know you need to do for yourself and take this as an opportunity to to do those, but don't make your list 20 miles long of, uh, you know, during the coronavirus, I remodeled my house. I did all the things that were ever on my list of things to do because that's stressing people out too, right. you know, just I be so crazy. realistic. Yeah. Cause it's a hard time. I mean, it's a weird time and it is a hard time for everyone. You could be five, you could be 75, 85, 95. It's a hard time. Mm-hmm. So be like really kind and gentle to each other and to yourself during this time, because it's not easy. Yes. Your information today is very, very helpful. I really appreciate your expertise, your time, your information that I know is very well researched, um, your clinical experience. Thank you so much for sharing with everybody who hopefully watches this video, hopefully a lot of people. Yes. And again, to learn more about Dr. Bree and her practice, you can see that in the pinned comment at the end of this video. Anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Bree? No, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm glad I could put all my nightly and morning reads to, to benefit other people because it is something that's almost like a part-time to full-time job just keeping up on. So I'm glad to share. Thank you so much. Stay on and I'll uh, finish the recording and we'll chat before we go. Okay, sounds good.